الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم بعد we are continuing our studies within the work that is entitled جامع احكام النساء that is entitled a comprehensive examination of women's rulings as is what this work is offered by the serious Mustafa and Adawi may Allah be exalted and preserve him. And of all the areas we could have chosen to begin something this work, we chose to begin on the topic of nikah, on the topic of, of marriage. And in our last sitting, we looked at the definition of the word nikah, the definition of the word marriage, as it exists uh, in, the, in the Arabic language, as well as in the legislation in the shah. And we then enter into the section of this work that speaks to an encouragement concerning marriage, as well as an encouragement for extending one's lineage. Uh, and we focus on the verses of the Quran in this regard, or at least a selection of them. So after having entered into this section, we now want to move into a selection of ahadith, a selection of prophetic traditions that have come in the regard of encouraging nikah, in regard of encouraging, encouraging marriage. On this 22nd day of the month of brother of the year 1442 and of Gijari coinciding with what is the 6th of March of the year 2021 and So the first hadith that comes here, it has been collected by al Bukhari, and it comes from the authority of Anas ibn Malik. May Allah be pleased with him. As he states, there was a party of three that came to the houses of the wives of the Prophet asking about the worship of the Prophet and just in these lines here we find some interesting anecdotes as it relates to Kapwa and as it relates to our social interaction with one another we pose a question. The discourse here is between some visitors and the wives of the Prophet thus far. It's coming on the authority of Ennis, Ennis the Malik. How would Ennis and Malik be aware that the wives of the Prophet had visitors coming to their home? They now read it to him. Good. Keep going. What do we think? And uh, for those of us that are studying the four year hadith of the Noe, maybe hadith number 13 may be of assistance to us in some way or some So, what do we think? Keep going. Uh, and it's in Malik was in the household of mm. one of uh, uh, wives of the Messenger of Allah. Good. So, Anna Sidna's mother, she had submitted him as a servant to the Messenger of Allah in his home area for whatever he needed, how he could, how he could assist. And he remained there working with the Prophet and serving him, assisting him in his home life for how many years? Because he was a child initially, but for how many years? Nah. Good. About a decade. About a decade. So, why would Anas ibn Malik's mother do this? Tarbiya. Tarbiya, cultivation, so he can be raised properly. That's correct. Keep going. It was probably the best place for him to be. That's the best place for him to be. Good. She, but the mother wanted the best for her child. So she put her child in the best company that she could think of, the Messenger of Allah, so as much of that guidance as possible 
as much access as possible could reach Ennis in a manner so they could benefit from that presence and that interaction, which in fact he did. So he's actually present there to witness some of the inner workings in the home life of the Messenger of Allah, so the Allah Bible says it. So he's in a prime position to give certain details that others would normally not be privy to. Make sense? Good. Now, these visitors who they remain who they remain nameless here, they're coming for what purpose? What's their purpose in, in the stopping box? Knowledge to learn. Good. They wanted to know about the worship of the Prophet. Good. So this is interesting in that we now see that the Muslims used to visit one another. Imagine that. And not always announce. You just stop by, check on people, see what's going on, like quick visit, whatever have you. Right? This is what they used to do in their community. They would engage with one another, visit one another in their home. And it just so happens they're coming looking for the messenger of Allah, so Allah will send them, but he's not home. He's out being the messenger of Allah, so Allah will send them. So when they come, he's not there. Good. Interestingly, interestingly enough, there is still an exchange between these visitors and the wives of the messenger of Allah, so Allah will send them. So there is still discourse there, but they're doing so with taqwa. They're doing so with, with piety. They're doing so while observing hijab. Good. And what's interesting later on is that we'll see that the Prophet himself didn't find fault with them for, for visiting, one. Visiting unannounced, two. Three, still engaging with the, with the family to seek what they were seeking out. Okay, good. So then once they inform them, so then once they inform them, but then my host we don't can know who to call new house. So once they inform them, who are they in this? The wives and the visitors. Good. So once the wives inform the visitors about their question. About the worship of the Prophet. So they're coming for righteous reasons. It's as if they belittled it. It's like they were expecting to hear much more than what they heard. Good. So then they said, meaning to be they said, well, where are we from the Prophet <laughs> when Allah has already forgiven him of his past and future sins? What did they say? They're coming to learn about his worship so they can emulate him in his worship. He's the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the messenger of the creation. We're trying to better ourselves spiritually, so what better example to take from him? Let's find out what he did so that we can do what he did. Then when they hear it, it's like it's not really a whole lot to them. They were expecting it to be much more. So now they make this statement. Who are we from the Messenger of Allah? Who are we from the Prophet of Allah? Allah already forgave him of all his past and future sins. What do you believe in that? Why would they, why would they make this statement like this? What do we do? They're seeking to make an excuse for the Prophet وسلم, and why his worship is not more than what they heard about. They're trying to make a reason. Well, he doesn't really need to worship that much because I already forgave him of his sin. And we're not forgiven like he is, so we need to be worshiping more than him. That becomes their, their thought process. Okay? Good. So one of them said, Call the Ahadu. You say what now? I think this is the idea for okay. Okay. So one of them said, 
اما انا as myself I don't send me a name ever so one of the things as myself I'm going to pray throughout the night forever but on an alpha and then another said and I'll assume it's better when I up this and another said I'm going to fast for all of time and I will not break my fast Every single day, fast. Well, call it out, huh? And another said, Anna, I tell you to fast. I am going to remain abstinent from women. But that is to go with Abadah. And I will not marry ever. And uh, not here, but we'll add this. In, in another narration, another word is in the Hadith. Another one mentioned, another mention, uh, I'm not going to eat meat ever. Abstain from meat. Okay? So then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa comes. And he comes back. Right? I guess they wait for him, he comes back. And he says, And to Adalina Kuntu Kazawakala, you all are the ones that have been saying this and that. So then now the messenger of Allah is going to come home. The wives tell him about what had taken place when he was gone. That's that home interaction bit. That's the relationship. Okay? Brings him up to speed on what's happening inside of his home. It is that. And this is anything, you know, negative or underhanded or anything like that, right? It is. So he says, You all the ones that have been asking and saying this and that. So now he responds to this and he says, I swear by Allah, I have the most khashya of Allah amongst you all. And I have the most taqwa of Allah amongst you all. So I am the most fearing of Allah. I am the most conscious of Allah. I am the most tight of Allah amongst everyone here. Amongst all of them. However, that can be assumed of this. I fast. And I, I break my fast. Well, suddenly I pray. I mean, I pray at night. Bible prayer, prayer, the end of the day, the hajj, the night prayer. And I lie down. What does Obu Jumni say? And I marry women. Of course, we understand this inversely. Uh, for women, and I marry men. Women are not me that. I'm Sunni, but it's a Mindy. So whoever strives against my sunnah, then he is not of me. So these individuals thought that it was pious for them and most pleasing to Allah for them to go to the farthest extent of what they thought imaginable to be worshipped. When in reality, the best of worship is that which is balanced and consistent. A hubbul a'ma Allah, the most beloved of access to Allah, adwaraha wa inqanna, are the actions that we're most consistent in, even if it is not a lot. Good. And this is something that is relative. Each person on their level. What you have the ability to be consistent in may be different than someone else. For you, it may be fasting Mondays and Thursdays. For someone else, it may be fasting three days out of the month. For someone else, they may pray three units of prayer in the night. For someone else, that person may pray five or seven. But whatever is the comfort level for you, what you can be consistent in, and then you strike balance in your life. Because in our interactions with our family, in our learning, uh, academically and secularly, in our social interactions, all of these other areas of our lives are also relevant to the faith and in support of the faith. And these other areas of our lives can also become worshipped when we are right our, our intentions in those endeavors. 
So it's balanced. Okay. Also, we'll say this is something that is interesting. This shows us how the people of the past were. In that, as we stated earlier, they were striving to do the most of what was possible, of the most of what they could conjure in order to please the law. That was the mindset of the people in the past then. Today, the mindset is to do the least amount possible and then expect the most reward. You follow? Both of them are extreme. But this side is extreme in excess. And now, today, we have the problem of extremism in, uh, well, we're doing less. We're doing less. So, he states, whoever thrives against my sunnah is not from it. Fasting is a sunnah. Prayer is a sunnah. But, yet, he is saying concerning what they were doing is thriving against his sunnah. Again, balance. But what does this phraseology mean? He is not of me. What does that mean? Some of our hadiths we find, for they to minni, he's not of me. Other I had to find, for they to minna, this person is not of us. What does it mean? It means that. Mean it. He is not from the people who follow the message of the Lord. He's not from the people who follow the Messenger of Allah. So the law is done. Okay, good. So then can we say that these people were not followers of the Messenger of Allah? So the law is done. Yes? Okay, let's take that a step first. These people here, even though we don't know their name, they have to be of who? Which genre of, of person, which class of people are they from? These three names of people. They have to be what? If they're not Muslim, or if they're not from the message of Allah, message of Allah. Well, the three people in these hadith that came. They're Muslim. They're Muslim. Okay, they're Muslim. Good. What kind of Muslim? They, they, they have to be what? Extreme. Huh? Okay. Extremists. Keep going. What do we think? We agree. We disagree with you, Shah. They 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 may they may not learn from someone else, and then they punish, punish folks, and let them go about the law. So they can learn, you know, from their direction, from their plan, from their business, right? Somewhere different, they will punish folks. Okay, good. So by default, it appears that these are people who met the Prophet and believed in him. And from that we can posit that they died upon the flesh. That's the definition of a, a companion, a sahabi. So then can we say those things like this about the sahabi? Okay, good. Um, that's just from the standpoint of Edith. Now, this phraseology uh, for they to mention that when we see it, it means Laysa ala tariqati. This person is not upon my methodology. Laysa ala akhlaqi. This person is not upon my tower. Uh, it can also at times indicate Laysa uh, ala shiriatina. This person is not upon our sharia, not upon our legislation. So when we see this type of phraseology, this is what it can. Um, not meaning that these three are bad people in any fashion. However, in this particular area, they then can have better guidance in this particular area, which is what they came there for in the first place. You follow? So it's well intentioned. They had an understanding, and then their understanding was, was incorrect. Okay, good. Possible that those of us people of knowledge that take this phraseology and state that it can be an indicator of a deed being a major sin. 
it can be an indicator of a need being a major sin. Meaning, in this case, because the Prophet is saying, whoever strives against my sunnah is not from me. These individuals were not striving against the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. They were coming to learn the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. But if what he is stating here, we can understand from what he is saying that a person who purposefully strives against the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that action of opposing his sunnah can be an indicator of a major sin. This is an indicator that that could be a major sin, opposing the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But our focus here, of course, is extracting the encouragement as it relates to marriage and marital life. Our shahid, our focal point here, is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stating, well, as the I marry women. I have a family. I grow my family. This is my sunnah. So then you, in following my sunnah, should also marry, should also seek to grow your family as well. Um, not to mention the interaction that we see in its household in the beginning of a particular marriage. In the next hadith that we have here, it comes on the authority of Ma'kid Ibn Yathar. As he states, uh, a man came to the Prophet in this hadith of And he said, I have come across a woman who she has stature and beauty. However, she is not able to bear children. Should I marry her? How do we know she's not able to bear children? One more time. She didn't tell us? She had it. It's good. She had to tell us. Maybe she told us. How was she done? Maybe she was married before. Good. So maybe she was married before at some point and throughout her life she just never had children. Right? Possibly then she may not be able to bear children. Sometimes it's a timing thing, sometimes it's a it's a person thing, right person, right? Okay, good. So why would this person be saying this to the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because it's the important thing. Then it's important children. The importance of lineage, the importance of children. Good. So he's coming to him seeking marital advice. You see that? So we understand here that the companions will seek marital advice. Likewise, we should seek marital advice. But we see that this individual wasn't going to just anyone to seek marital advice. He was going to someone that could give him proper marital advice. Not just anyone just because I know this person. Not just anyone because this is my friend, but no, a person that has the ability to give me what I'm actually seeking in a proper and professional way. So what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He says, she has good stature, right? She's good stature in society, okay? Uh, she's good looking, but it just happens that she never seems able to bear children. Should I marry? He says, left. He advises him no. Then the man came back to him a second time. And then he came back to him a third time. So he must have really liked this particular woman and wanted to wanted to marry her, but he was conflicted about it. So he's coming back and coming back. So if he got a no the first time, and then he came back a second time, the answer was probably still no. So then he comes back a third time. If I keep asking her, maybe he'll tell me something different. Okay. So then the advice of the Prophet of Allah concerning marriage, and this is something that we can actually understand both ways, uh, male and female. So go would you and will do and will Marry those who are loving and fruitful. For certainly, for any but certainly I will have the largest of nations of you all. 
So, and who do? Loving. What do we think that means? Nurturing. Nurturing. Caring. Able to raise children. Give them love and affection. Okay, good. So, marrying a person who loves their spouse, right? Marry someone who is passionate. Marry someone who has compassion. Does that make sense? Okay. And Hulu, one who is fruitful. That should be pretty clear. Fruitful means can bear children. Good. And the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating here, for I will have the greatest in size of a nation. When? At what point? Yeah. On the day of resurrection. The greatest Ummah will be that of the, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that happens how? By us having children. Good. We embrace Islam. That's some of those numbers. Right? But then we also marry. We have children. And then we do what we do. We raise them upon Islam. And then after we raise them upon Islam, we make sure I we hope that they carry enough to continue carrying on their own from that point forward. Because we can give our children love, we can give our children knowledge, we can give our children opportunity, we can protect them, we can do all these things. But there's one thing we cannot give them. We cannot give them that. We can't do that. We can set the stage for it. We can't give that. That is between them and Allah. And so long as the parents have done their job in raising those children correctly in accordance with the extent of their ability, after that point, as the children begin to enter into adulthood, then the parents are not necessarily accountable if the children veer off from that point forward. So, This is an interesting narration. This narration comes on the authority of Al Qabat. And he spent hours with Abdullah. Abdullah here is uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And Uthman met with him at Mina. Uthman here is who? Uthman ibn Affan. Good. So he then says to him, Oh Abu Abdurrahman, I have some need from you. So they went off to the side and cried. The man said, Oh Abu Abdurrahman, Abu Abdurrahman, this uh There's a better name for this, but we're going to call it an acronym. It's a better name for it, though, name. So this couldn't get here. I will draw a man too. Not a man. First man comes in, he's coming in upon me. Right? Elkhamah is making the narration, but Elkhamah is with. He's with. Not even him up. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. So they're together, and then a man comes in and tells, I'm going to drop a man, I got a need with you. And they go up to the side to have a discussion in private. And he's calling him out by Abu Abdurrahman. Who is Abu Abdurrahman? He's the father of Abdurrahman. Good. So this is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. It is a practice of the people of the past. Generally, in the practice of hadith scholarship particularly, that those that are beloved to us and those we have high respect for, that we call them by their kunya. We call them by their agreement. And I'll think of the more exact term to we, we call them by uh, their kunya, father of so-and-so, mother of so-and-so. This is why that's being done. It's a, it becomes a term of respect and endearment. 
So he's not calling him Abdullah, he's calling him Abu Rahman. Okay? Good. Out of Rahman's love and respect for Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. But what is he saying to him? Shall I marry you to a virgin that will remind you of the days when we were young? Yeah, they speak to each other. Okay. So then when he saw that Abdullah had no need for this, he then pointed to me. He said, oh, I'll come out. So this goes on, he makes the offer, and al Kamaf also declines. So the man now says, have you all not heard what the Prophet said to us? Ya ma'ashur al-shabab, O youth, min sultaa'a minkum al-ba'a fayatazawwaj. Whoever amongst you has the da'a to marry, has the ability to marry, then he should do so. And whoever is not able, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَيَ فَعَلَيْهِ بِسْتُمْ فَإِنُّهُ لَهُ بِجَاءٍ And whoever doesn't have the ability to do so, then this person should fast, for fasting is a shield, meaning a shield, uh, protecting you from your desires. This particular hadith was collected by, by Muslims. What do we think is meant here by ba'a? Whoever must you have the ba'a or the ability to marry. What do we think that's about? What would entail the ability to marry? Well, uh, help. Help? What's the mistake? Time. Time. You said what was that? Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Okay, good. Uh, so there are there are three main main views here. In no particular order. There are those who say that having the ability to marry means the ability to provide from the man's standpoint, the ability to provide for marriage, right? But for, for the woman's standpoint, they think that she will be providing in the relationship as well. So they can provide for one another in the relationship. You have the ability to do that. Two is jima, is intercourse. You have the ability to satisfy another person intimately. The third view is both. You have the ability to provide what's necessary in the marriage of you, and you have the ability to satisfy a spouse intimacy. So, We'll fulfill this narration. So. There comes on the authority of Sabbath on Ennis, as he says, the Messenger of Allah said, Hopefully, that the lady had been a dunya in the sad, what he would do in a quarter to I need the salah. Made beloved to me what I love from this worldly life. Women, fragrance, and the prayer has been made the coolness of my heart. So these are, are things that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found pleasure in, in his life, outside of just his spiritual life, in his everyday being a human being. Okay? So he enjoyed the companionship of the opposite gender. So he enjoyed marriage. He liked to take care of himself, of his hygiene, how he looks, how he smells. And he also loved prayer as well. Yeah. That point, um, to keeping yourself up and hygiene and like that, um, is it blameworthy to do that for the opposite sex? No, no, actually, no. It's encouraged to do that for for the opposite sex, right? And we know those indicators 
uh, within our text concerning a, a woman and a woman beautifying herself or her husband and things of this nature. But we would find the companions that if a bat may not be pleased with him, he was uh, someone that we would describe as uh, as being fly. Right? So he was a he was a snazzy dresser. Okay? And he wouldn't only do so outside of his home when he came out, like right, looking sharp, smelling nice, carrying himself a certain way. Nothing wrong with that. He would also do it at home. So he would ask, why are you getting yourself all fancied up and in, you're inside the house? So he said that he likes to adorn himself for his wife the same way he likes his wife to adorn herself for him. Make sense? In the West, we have this concept of we get dressed up for other people outside of the home. And that's fine, but it doesn't negate the reality in our heritage that we also do so even more so for the people that are closest to us inside of us. Does that make sense? You're going to do it for people that you don't even know, right? It makes more sense to do it for the people that you do know. Okay. Yes. From the from the to the person that we have, for example, they um have the parcel, they have um you know things that were with them out to the summer, but they're not um necessarily you know physically attracted to them. Is that something that we have like integrated into the living? Not at all. That's from the sunnah. From a Buddhist perspective, it's just asking: Is it from the sunnah to be attracted to the person that you want to marry? Absolutely a sunnah. Absolutely a sunnah. Um, evidenced by, for example, this companion, a couple narrates back, he was saying, listen, she has good social stature and she's beautiful. The Prophet so could have been find fault with, with his saying that. That wasn't the issue. The issue was that she couldn't bear children, right? But the fact that she was beautiful was a factor to be considered. Um, we also have we mentioned last week, I don't know if we did uh, on or off camera, but, but last week we were we were speaking about the reasons as to why people marry. And we can understand it both ways, the male and the female. But the Messenger of Allah he mentioned, uh, a woman is married for four reasons. We've heard the hadith before, right? A woman is married for four reasons. What are the four reasons? Huh? Could the humanity have for a beauty that? Her stature, but her, her height, uh, her wealth, that's three. And then before, uh, lineage is hot for stature, right? Stature, a societal standing, a lineage, that's a clue. And her deed, right? And her deed. So then the Prophet says, the Prophet says, that the deed, check it back that. And uh, select the one who has deed. So that's the one who has religion, may your two hands be just covered. Okay? We have a misnomer concerning the understanding and application of this hadith. Um, some of us, not saying anybody here, some of us have a tendency to think that this hadith means we look for someone who has religion and not someone who has the other qualities. Now the hadith. What the hadith means is that the religiosity of the person is the foundation. Okay? These are the most frequent reasons why people marry other people. These four reasons. Religiosity is the foundation. That's bare minimal, bare bones. But if you can find a person who has the other qualities too, that's even better. The more the qualities the person has, the more, uh, the more you should want to marry that person. So if the person has religion and beauty, that's a plus. If the person has religion, beauty, and wealth, that's a plus plus. If the person has religion, uh, uh, beauty, wealth, and good standing in society, that's a plus plus plus. That's the understanding of the hadith, right? Also, we know from the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, 
when some of your hands were seeking advice about, about marrying and what's the seed of the person that you're married. The Prophet ﷺ said to look for in her which gives you vigor to marry. Right? They were very um, respectful. They had they had language, they had uh, manners in their language. But the meaning is look for in the person which you're attracted to that raises your desire toward wanting to be with a person like that. About. So all of this would then seem to indicate to us, and the indications are true, that from the sunnah is also being attracted to the person that you're that you're with, right? Also, in the other hadith that we mentioned, it states to marry someone who is wadus one or walu, uh, to, to marry someone who is who is who is loving and fruitful. A part of a part of the love is also the attraction. Yes, sir. Okay. So we've been uh, going on for a bit now. There are a few more narrations here, but perhaps we can pause here for this week and we'll continue this next week in Shalom Sada. Have those other items for the level of item. Yes. Um, I didn't hear you clear. One more time. What Someone doesn't want to have children. Sure. Sure, from the source. When the Prophet told this person to not marry the person who was childbearing, 